the National Hockey League need to attack this and figure this out. And one last point. Nothing scares me more than any human being who says, I'm not doing this because of my religious beliefs. Because when you looked at people's lives, you normally say that publicly, you'd throw up at what you saw. I hope I got some people around here that are going to take a stand because they're not just satisfied with sports stars. They'd like to take down the church. Now imagine you're Ivan Provorov. And from the time you were very young, all you dreamed about, worked for, and wanted to be was a professional hockey player. You loved your time on the ice. You loved going to practice. You went to practice early, stayed later than everybody else, doing drills all by yourself. You used to dream about it, think about it. You used to watch the greats, study them. You sought out people that could help you perfect your game. Can you tutor me? Can you practice with me? Can you, can you show me? Can you help me just get 1% better? Can you help me every day to get a little bit better? And all you dreamed about was being a professional hockey player. You dreamed about being on the Olympic team, representing your country on the national stage. You thought about the competition. You loved the competition. You wanted to beat the best of the best and to be the best of the best. And this is all you worked for. Then when you realize your dream, you become a professional hockey player. One day you leave your house in the morning and you head over to the arena to prepare for a game that evening. When you come into your locker room, sitting on the locker, there's a bunch of pro promotional material and a jersey, an LGBTQIA plus thematic colors and promotions. They want you to wear this. There's no choice. There's no alternate jersey. Just wear this jersey, come on out of the locker room, skate around a few times, take a few pictures, do a couple poses, maybe a couple twirls, a couple plies, stick the landing, and then you can go on back about your business. And he decides, hmm, you know, I put a lot of sacrifice into getting here. I worked very hard to get here. I ate right, I had a good diet, I had a good gym regimen, I was strict on myself, I worked very hard to be a hockey player. I don't remember in my contract, it's saying that I would have to promote these other lifestyles. I don't remember saying, hey, you know what? I wanna be used someday to promote all this stuff on behalf of an agenda that I have no part in. That's really what I want. I want to be an influencer to youth and future generations and make people aware about the actions and personal decisions of these other people that have nothing to do with me. Not only do they have nothing to do with me, but they're completely opposed to things that I've learned and been taught and understood to be true my entire life. And now you want me to put on this jersey and skate around and promote it and join the club. And they say, yeah, it's just a, it's just a jersey, man. It's, it's nothing. Look, it's a couple colors. It's just a jersey. It's a little thing. Just put it on, skate around, and show people that, that you're part of the club, that you're with the movement. Show people that you're on board with what's going on. I give him the wink and the gun. And he says, no, I'm not doing it. I'm going to stand up for what I know has been right. He says, I'm going to be true to myself. Yeah, I, uh, I respect everybody. And I respect everybody's choices. My choice is to stay true to myself and my religion. That's all I'm going to say. Said that's all I'm going to comment on that. Um, if you have any hockey questions, I would like I would answer those. Hey, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to play hockey. That's why you're even interested in me in the first place. That's why this arena is here. That's what puts people in the seats. That's what sells tickets. We're here to play hockey. We're not here to be part of anything else. And when he doesn't put on the the jersey, this little thing becomes catastrophic. And it reminds me of the time when Kramer didn't wear the ribbon. Just a little thing. Just a tiny thing. Just one little ribbon. That's all we're asking you to wear. Uh, okay, you're checked in. Yeah, thank you. Here's your AIDS ribbon. Uh, no, thanks. 
You don't want to wear an AIDS ribbon? Uh, no, no. But you have to wear an AIDS ribbon. I have to? Yes. Yeah, see, that's why I don't want to. But everyone wears the ribbon. You must wear the ribbon. You know what you are? You're a ribbon bully. Hey! Hey, you! Come back here! Come back here and put this on! Ribbon bully. Jersey bully. Why do I have to? What makes me have to? Why do I have to sign on? Why do I have to join the club? Why do I have to promote these things? Why don't I have a choice, a personal choice? If I'm out here to respect people's personal choices and their personal decisions, why do I not get a choice? Who do you think you are? Put the ribbon on. Hey, Cedric, Bob, this guy won't wear a ribbon. Who? Who doesn't want to wear the ribbon? Why is it anybody else's business what I do with my life? Nobody wants me interfering with their life, what they decide to do, what they decide to wear. But I choose not to wear this jersey, and it's a big deal. We respect people's decisions. Just like you said, I respect people's decisions, and my decision is to stay true to myself. Now, we all know somebody. I got friends, and I got family who are involved in these kinds of actions and behaviors and lifestyles that move down that path. I don't agree with it. They might not agree with me. They might not agree with anything that I'm saying here right now. They might not agree that I, that I go to church multiple times a week. That I love God, that I pray, that I want to raise my family in this. That I serve God, teach about God, tell about God, that I study the Bible. That I want to draw close to God might not make sense to them and they might think it's futile and might not like it might not agree with it but that's my choice and my decision about what I want to do with my life now I had a friend we were in high school it was either our sophomore year or junior year that he decided that he was going to come out as homosexual and we have been close for many years and when I heard about it, I approached him and we spoke one-on-one. -on -one and I let him know, I don't agree with what you are deciding to do. I don't agree with the path that you're going down. And I believe that your life was meant for something more. That you were created for something better. And that this is not what's going to make you happy. And this is not going to be something that's healthy for you. This is not what your life was meant to be. This is not who you are. Now, I'm not going to let anybody talk about you. I'm not going to talk about you. I'm not going to let anybody harm you. I'm not going to let anybody threaten you. I'm not going to let anybody bully you. Now, if this is what you want to do, this is what you're going to do, I'm going to make sure that nobody hurts you. But I do not support you. This is not what your life is meant to be. And I let him know that I loved him. And this thing, whatever he's going through, if you need somebody to talk to, I can help you. If you, if you just, I mean, whatever it is, the stress or the anxiety or whatever kind of pressure you're going against, if you just need somebody to stand with you, I'll stand with you. Because I don't want you to go down this path. That's not what you were meant to be. That's not what your life is. We're not out here to bash people for their decisions. We're not out here to harm people for their decisions. But we do have to let people know that you were created for something more. God has something more for your life, that he has joy for your life, that he has peace for your life, that he has a calling and a purpose for your life. And to pursue after these other things and other lifestyles that are against God or to look at God and what he has for you and to turn away and say, I'm going the opposite way or to stand in opposition against God. That's not what your life is for, what it's meant to be. Now, I thank God for the elders. I thank God for men like my pastor who stand up for what is right and what's righteous and the things of God. And they stand up with boldness. And I'm going to be sharing a few clips from uh, my pastor, also Elder Mark Morgan. The elders, they had boldness. The past generations of men of God, they got boldness. They stood up for something. They stood against the grain. They stood up against the wave. 
never wavered, held on to the truth that there is still one God, his name is Jesus, that there's still separation from the world, there's still holiness, there's still requirements and standards and uh, a lifestyle that we have to live separated from the world and from its influence. The elders have boldness. And if there's one thing that I want to hold on to or glean or something I want to rub off on me from the previous generation, it's that boldness to just be steadfast steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, holding on to that truth, standing for that truth. You need people can be saved in that lifestyle? Sure I do. But that don't mean they need to compromise with that devilish spirit. Pastor, you shouldn't get so bold about that. Why not? They're bold with what they're doing. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. You can fly your flags and try to force it down our throat, but we ain't accepting it. Well, I hope I got some people around here that are going to take a stand because they're not just satisfied with sports stars. They'd like to take down the church. I like people that stand against the grain. I like people that exhibit boldness. I like when they tell us that we're the underdogs, that people stand up and say, absolutely not. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. If God be for us, who can be against us? Because it's never been about taking down stars and taking down millionaires and billionaires or people that have been successful in all kinds of uh, secular endeavors. It's always been about standing against God, suppressing truth and taking down the church. That is the greatest power in this world. As long as the church is filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost resides in the church, which is the body of Christ, it is the power in this world. As long as we have the name of Jesus Christ, the church is the power in this world. We're working, operating with the authority that God gives the church to work in this world. And so all these things, all these movements have never been about taking down other people and bashing other people and taking down institutions and laws. And it's never been about rights and never been about freedom. But it's always been the ultimate goal is to take down the church and the people of the living God. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are now before the council. And they're being berated and interviewed and scolded about what happened earlier in the day. That morning, they got up and went to the temple at the hour of prayer. And they see there a man laid at the gate called Beautiful. And every day he had been laid there in the morning, set there to ask alms or offering of people that were going into the temple. And every morning he would receive some offering and be picked up, carried home that day. And the next day they would bring him out in the morning, lay, them, lay him there in that very same place. Peter and John got tired of seeing him as they're walking into the temple. They say, today's the day we're going to do something about this. They approach him and they say, look on us. And he looks up at them expecting to receive something of them, something monetary, maybe food some provision for the day that he would need the next day and the following day again. But Peter and John say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I do have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. They reach down, take him by the right hand. And the Bible says immediately his feet and ankle bones received their strength. He leaped up and went in with them into the temple, leaping and praising God. Now, he was never allowed in the temple before. He was halt, he was maimed, he had a defect, but now he's been made whole. He goes into the temple and he's praising God with them. Immediately from that moment, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they get on their phones, social media, they're texting each other. Hey, we got to do something about this. The council gets together. I thought we got rid of Jesus. What are these people doing performing miracles in his name and preaching his name? I thought he was gone a long time ago. Acts chapter 4, verse 14. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, 
they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do to these men? We got rid of Jesus. He was crucified. You know how hard that was. It took a couple years, cost us a lot of money, but what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them. And there it is. There's the method. They were threatened in the Old Testament. Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego, they were threatened. Daniel, he was threatened. Elijah, Elisha, threatened. Peter, John, Paul, threatened. And today, the method is the same. The church is always getting threatened. When truth comes out, when you stand for truth and you speak and hold on to truth, there's always going to come a threat. Can we paralyze them with fear? Can we silence them with fear? Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. If you think it's a good idea that we should listen to you instead of listen to God, you deal with the consequences of that action and that choice. But us, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. I can only talk about the things that I've been taught through the word of God. I can only talk about the things that I've seen with my own eyes, the miracles that I've seen performed, the power of God that's moved and been present in my life, the times that he's opened doors when there was no way at all, the times he made a way of escape when I couldn't see one, the times he shut doors and allowed nobody to open it, the times that he's protected me and kept me, provided for me when I could not do it for myself, the things that I've seen and heard, those are the only things that I can talk about. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. The world's very bold. The world has no shame at all. But we need boldness. George Lopez, famous comedian, also jumped in on this. Also, if you're an enemy of drag, you're an enemy of mine. Right. <laughs> and then he wants a high five. If you're an enemy of drag, you're an enemy of mine. High five. Uh, okay. I cannot respect that. I cannot respect that. If you're an enemy of men dressing up in women's lingerie, wearing boas, glitter, sparkles, bedazzling themselves, high heels, leather, strappings, scantily clad, doing little dances. If you're an enemy or opposed to that, <laughs> <laughs> then you're my enemy. What a weird thing to say. You know what? I don't care what you say about me. I don't care what you say about my family. I don't care what you say about my country. I don't care what you say about my people, my ethnicity, my children. But if you ever speak against drag... You are my enemy. This, that just crosses the line for me. There's no going back from that. If you're, a, if you're an enemy of men dressing up, <laughs> oh my goodness. Come on, man. Take yourself seriously. There are more important things in life to stand up for, to stand with, more important things in life to stand against. That's not one of them. Now, he makes this statement out of any kind of context, completely non sequitur. It's not prompted at all. There's no, it's no flow in the conversation where, where he says this. He just decides, you know what? Now's the best time for me to go ahead and say this. Okay. Usually you won't make a statement like that unless you're passionate about something or you're in close pro proximity to something like that. Maybe somebody you know, your children, your friend, your brother gets involved in that and you want to you know, stand and 
in unison with them. Or maybe you're just making a, I don't know, some kind of confession or something. So now he jumps on board with this, but there's men of God, as I said, elders that are standing up for what's right. Then they seek to change the truth. You cannot change God's glory without ultimately changing God's truth. Now, I know that we're in 2023 and there is a danger in saying some of these things, but we need to say it, that God is very clear on gender distinction. The word of God is very clear on gender distinction. The word of God is very clear. That's our authority. Doesn't matter what the law says, doesn't matter what popular opinion says, doesn't matter what the, 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 the majority vote is, doesn't matter what the you know, trend of the day is, what the best hashtag is, what's the most popping. The word of God is very clear on issues that we stand on. That's what we stand on. This thing that is unchanging, your word is forever settled in heaven, does not change. God does not change. And that's what we stand on. He even told cattle, I don't want them lying out of their gender. And so, you know, here he is. I think it's very clear. Matter of fact, when he says a man should not wear that, a woman wears and vice versa. This is where you get the word transvestite. Because trans means to cross over. The word vestite was not yet done, but it was vestire, which is clothing. This is from that text. So it was dealing with cross-dressing. That's where you get the word transvestite or cross-dresser. And now, you know, I mean, they're trying to teach your kids stuff. Now, when I was little, we used to have Pride Week at school. And you would have pajama day, you would have superhero day, sports team day, twin day, nerd day, 80s day. But believe me, and if it hasn't already happened yet, it'll happen soon, where your children are going to bring home a flyer with a week Pajama day, 80s day, and smack dab in the middle of the week, maybe at the end of the week, it's going to be cross-dressing day. And what are we going to do then? Parents, we got to stand up and be bold. Teach our kids now what is right, the principles that they need to hold on to, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. We've got to hold on to these things and give our support to men of God that still preach this word with boldness, that are still standing up, preaching and declaring the word of God. And we take it for granted. When we, while they're a preacher, they're a man of God, of course they're going to preach the word. Not all the time. There's constant pressure to dance around issues, to not go straight at sin, to dance around things that would convict. There's pressure from outside the church there's pressure from inside the church. There's pressure from all over. But men of God that are still standing up and preaching that word. And thank God if you got a pastor like that, I know I got a pastor like that. That you stand up with them and say, preach that word. Now, what happens when you take truth and you exchange it for a lie? Every secular institution is moronic. And the most secular institution is the university, and that's where all the moronic ideas originate. How do they keep making so much advancement? How, how, how are, uh, you know, concepts that literally make no sense create this kind of momentum? Uh, there was an answer given by G.K. Chesterton, or it's a, a, at least attributed to him, late 19th century, early 20th century British thinker. When people stop believing in God... They don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. Hmm. That's the answer to your question. When people stop believing in God, it's not that they believe in nothing now. But at that point, their mind is willing to believe in anything, anything else. Now, this man's answer 
is coming from Romans chapter 1. When you read Romans chapter 1 and Paul's writing to the church, he's explaining what he calls secularism. He's explaining how moving from that mindset of knowing God, recognizing God, acknowledging God, and moving to a mindset of secularism where you're trying to remove God from your knowledge. What are the consequences and the results, the symptoms of taking that action? Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Again, that's the way it's been from the beginning. It's all these other things, all these other movements. It's not about freedom and liberty and all. It's, it's not about taking out enemies. It's about suppressing the truth. And it's always been about suppressing the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. Everything that we look at and more and more discover about the universe, the world we live in, God's principles, his power, his intelligence, his wisdom, his activity becomes more and more plain. The more that we discover about the universe and about life and about godly principles and how they play out in our lives, it it becomes more and more clearly perceived so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. As he said, the most moronic ideas come from the universities where this is where you get your wisdom. Huh? I, this, I, got my, I got my degree. My wife is educated. And there's value in education. There's value in your degree and your hard work and your sacrifice and your studying when you take it seriously and you go there to learn and to be educated. You go there to obtain something. But there's also an agenda of instilling secularism in the people that go there to fill their head with these ridiculous, he says, moronic ideas. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, for that reason, God gave them up in the lust of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Now, he's, he's speaking about society moving toward secularism as a whole, people that cultures and and nations and people that once knew God, even individuals that once knew God, acknowledged God, are now moving either throughout their lifetime or by generation or by nationality or by nation or by culture are moving away from God. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Now, when he says they exchange the truth of God for a lie, it's like when you go to a different country. If I've been to Costa Rica, Israel, Portugal, Italy. And when you exchange your U.S. dollar or whatever nation you're from, you, say, you exchange the currency of your country to be able to spend money in the country that you're visiting, you have to go to a money changer where they exchange your currency for another. And so that's what he's talking about here. They exchanged the truth about God. They went to the changers and they exchanged it for a lie. They exchanged truth for a different currency, a currency that, Profits you in this world, in this society, 
when you exchange the truth about God, the truth about his word and what you know about God, if you can trade that for a currency and operate in secular society, now you can move in their group. Now you can belong to the group. Now you can belong to the club and you can accomplish things within the club. If you, if you are just willing to change or exchange that truth for a lie. And they worship the creature rather than the creator. It's a movement from worshiping God to self-worship. And for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. He said, you want to do this. If you want to worship yourself and you want to worship other things besides me, here you go. I am letting you free to do what you want to do. God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men, receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. We don't, it, everybody knows you don't have to point out when you live this kind of lifestyle, it's not healthy for you. It's a, it's a, a dangerous lifestyle. There are consequences. There are consequences of physically in your body and detriments to your health, anxious, stressed, paranoid, there are consequences to, to, to leaving God's principles and leaving a pursuit of God and moving after, moving away from him into these things. It, it comes with natural consequences. And so when he says they receive within themselves or within their bodies the recompense, the due penalty for their error, the thing that was naturally going to come, God's trying to protect you from some things sometimes. It's not just being harsh on you for no reason, but everything that God asks you to do or asks for you or sets limits or boundaries on around his people is because he's trying to protect and keep and be good to you. But since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness and malice. They are full of envy, murder and strife, deceit and maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. And though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things, anything that was just listed, he says, God's decree says that when you practice these things, they deserve to die. Now, that's not to say if you're disobedient to parents that somebody should exact upon you capital punishment. Somebody, somebody should go out with the vengeance and find anybody who participates or has any of these problems, envy, deceit, maliciousness, gossip, or any kind of other activity in your life or whatever spirit you're dealing with that somebody's going to come and, and wish death upon you or exact death upon you. But the wages of sin is death. And so what he's talking about is at the end of your life when judgment comes, if this is what's housed in your life, this is the kind of life that you led and the things that you went after. Eternal life will not be there. And though they know that God's decree, his righteous decree, says that they that practice such things deserve to die, they not only continue to do them, but give approval to those who practice them as well. The King James Version says, they take pleasure in those that do them. God, give us boldness. 